All right, so um, if you want to open up your Bibles to Mark, man, I hope I didn't do this all through my notes today. Mark chapter 14. I think I might have given you, I, you guys Mark chapter 4, but it's actually Mark chapter 14, 53 through 56. So 53 through 65. Um, here's the deal. For about two weeks now, the only thing that's been on my mind is more than just a man, all right? And so uh, today, that's really what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about Jesus. And I want to talk to you about the fact that he was absolutely more than just a man. And I want to point out the ways uh, in which he was more than just a man. And I'm going to get to it in a little bit, but it's, um, here's the deal. If you believe that Jesus was more than just a man, then it demands a response from you. It demands it. There is no neutrality. There is no, I'll decide later. If he was who he said he was, then it demands that you respond to him in some way, shape, form, or fashion. So we have here, when Jesus is brought before uh, the Sanhedrin and brought before Caiaphas in Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 53. And I'll just go ahead and read these verses. He says, And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. Peter followed at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he sat with the servants, and he warmed himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. Many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies didn't even agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, Well, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build up another made without hands. But not even did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and he asked Jesus, And he said, do you answer nothing? What is it that these men testify against you? But he, Jesus, kept silent and answered nothing. Can I just interject here for a second? So in this next phrase, we don't see it in our English language. But if you study it, apparently the way Caiaphas addresses Jesus was, it was like he was putting him under oath. And he was required to give a response. So up to this point, Jesus has said nothing. But then the high priest puts him under oath. So verse 61, but he kept silent and answered nothing. But then the high priest asked him, saying to him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming With the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. And he said what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. And then some began to spit on him. And to blindfold him. And to beat him. And to say to him prophesy. And the officers struck him. With the palms of their hands. Who was Jesus? Actually, it's the most important question you'll ever answer for yourself in your life. It's not, it's not ask yourself, it's answer for yourself. The most important question you'll ever answer for yourself in your life is who was Jesus? So first of all, and, and look, I'm just going to apologize. I got, I don't even know. I got so many scriptures as I started out on this. I've tried to pare it down as best I could. If at some point you, I tell you what I'll do. I'm going to clean up my outline a little bit. And if later on during the week or something, you'd like a copy of it with the scriptures on it, I'll be happy to print some out and happy to give it to you. And I'm going to, I'm going to be, we're going to be going and I'm going to be turning to, I don't have them marked, uh, but we're going to be turning, flipping through. Really would like for you to follow along. Guys up there will probably do better than I'll do as far as getting to the scriptures on time. But anyhow, so here, here's what I want you to know. Here, listen, I, let me just start with this right here. Make no mistake about it, okay? Jesus said that he was God. Amen. 
All right? Don't miss that. He didn't say he was a great teacher. He didn't say he was a rabbi. He didn't, he didn't say that, that, you know, he was some moral guy, some philo- ph- philosopher. Jesus said that he was God. And so either he was or he was not. And you need to answer that question for yourself. Because if he was, and if you agree that he was, then it demands that you respond to him as God and as the Christ. So uh, Caiaphas asked him, so Caiaphas says, first of all, he says, are you the Christ? It's the first question. So listen, we use Jesus Christ. We put them together. We use them almost like they're a first and last name. I mean, seriously. But, but what, what I need you to understand is this, this word Christ is not a name. All right? It's really not his name, Jesus Christ. The word Christ is, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It is, it is a title. It is a title. Literally, we should say Jesus the Christ or Christ Jesus because the word Christ is a title. Literally, it means anointed one. And from the Old Testament, it is the word Messiah. It's the word Messiah. And so they were expecting a Messiah. They were expecting the anointed one, the one that God would send, the one who would be uh, the king of God's kingdom. They were looking for this person. They understand that this person would come one day in some shape, form, or fashion. And so Caiaphas, because he clearly understood that Jesus had been claiming to be this one, God in the flesh. So Caiaphas asked him, are you the Messiah? He says, are you the Christ? Listen, the, the, the question is as straightforward as it can be. And the answer is as straightforward as the question. Jesus says, I am. He says, yes. He says, I am. He says, not only that, but I, I, I think this is interesting too. He says, but not only that, he says, I am. And after this, you are going to see me sitting at the right hand of the power. The place of the anointed. The place of the Messiah. The place of Christ. He says, you're going to see me seated at the right hand of the power. And he says, you will see me coming on the clouds of glory. On the clouds of heaven. Uh, Glory was my phrase. Glory was my word. He said, and you're going to see me coming. Jesus is clearly saying, yes, I am the Messiah. I am the one that you will see seated at the right hand of the Father. I am the one that you will see seated at the right hand of power. And not only that, but I am the Messiah, the one that you are expecting, and I will be coming on the clouds of heaven, and you will see me. Caiaphas says to him, are you the Messiah? And Jesus says, you better make no mistake about it, I definitely am the Messiah. Listen, you can't explain that away. Don't let anybody try to explain that away in your life. It was as straightforward and as plain spoken as it could be. And then he calls him the son of the blessed. Uh, or he asks him. He says, are you the, are you the Christ, uh, the son of the blessed? Now here's the reason I want to spend a little time on this. Is because, again, Jesus claimed to be God. Let me... Let me You know why they killed Jesus? Seriously. Yeah. Jesus was not executed for anything that he did. He was executed because of who he was. Not for committing a crime, but for being God. That's why he was executed. He says, so are you the son of the blessed? And I want to take this off because, again... Caiaphas is asking him, are you the son of God? Are you the son of the blessed? And in his answer, Caiaphas understood. You see, I don't even know how to get to where I want to go. But I I do know how to get to where I want to go. Here's what you got to understand. So, in our language, in our culture, if... I say I'm the son of Tom Royal, all right? That doesn't mean I am Tom Royal, right? It just means I'm his son, correct? Now, there's a good connection there. Listen, there's a lot of Tom Royal that's in me, all right? I'll be the first to admit that. But I am not Tom Royal. I am Keith Royal. I'm the son of Tom Royal. 
But I need you to understand, and we're going to look at a couple verses here in a, in a minute that really validate this. When Jesus said that he was the Son of God, it wasn't the way you and I in the English language understand the Son of, God, the son of someone. When he said that he was the Son of God, he was saying, I am God. When he was calling God his Father, he was saying that that's me. Look at John chapter 5, 16 through 18. I can tell right now. Did y'all bring lunch? John, John chapter 5. Yeah, we might want to order some pizza. Uh, John chapter 5, uh, 16 through 18. So listen to this. It says, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus, and they sought to kill him because he had done things on the Sabbath. So they were mad at him because he was healing and doing stuff on the Sabbath. Uh, but Jesus answered them, listen, and he said, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Now look at verse 18. Here's, here's the kicker. He says, therefore, the Jews sought all the more to, hit, to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, listen, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So what I'm wanting you to understand is that when he said to them, God is my father, what they heard him say is that me and God were the same. That's what they heard. That's clearly what John says right there. Uh, but he said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So look at John chapter 10, verse 30. So, and again, I'm just trying to establish the fact that Jesus said that he was God. In chapter 10, verse 30, well, it doesn't get a whole lot clearer than this when Jesus just says, well, me and the father, we're one. We're one. I and the father are one. We are one. One. And then there's a passage in John chapter 14. John chapter 14 is a very familiar passage uh, to everyone. It's the whole, let not your heart be troubled. You've believed in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions of war, and so I would have told you. And so, and then he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and all this. And so after this, I think it starts in verse 9, uh, Philip says to Jesus, he says, Jesus, just show us the Father, and, and that'll be enough. He says, just, just let us see the Father. And, and that'll be sufficient. And Jesus says to him, he says, Philip, have I been with you this whole time and yet you still don't know who I am? He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's what Jesus said to him. He says, I've been with you all this time and you really still don't get it. You really still don't understand and know that I'm the Father. He says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So uh, uh, next step I want to take is I want you to know that the writers of the, of the Bible, the writers of the New Testament, all believed that Jesus was God. They all believed and declare and proclaim in some way that Jesus was God. And I don't have, I'm just going to tell you right now, I don't have time to go through every scripture I have. I'm going to pick one here. I'm going to pick Titus chapter 2 verse 13 uh, because I think this one says it about as plain, about as plain, about as plain if I start quoting lines from the play, y'all just forgive me, all right? So about as plain as, as you can do it. So he says here in Titus, he says, We are looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says our God and our Savior are one and the same. We are looking for his appearing. Our God and our Savior, Jehovah and Jesus are exactly the same. They are one and they are one in the flesh. Now, here's the deal. You see, if you think of attributes that God had, Jesus had all of those attributes. First of all, one of the things that we always say about God or declare about God is that, is that God is eternal, right? You know, you've always, you've always gotten that one from your kids. Well, how could God have always existed? Remember how you just kind of stumbled around that one, blah, 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 blah. And you finally just said, well, because he's God and he can do that, right? You know, but listen, we understand and by faith, we declare that God has always existed. Let me let you in on a little secret. Jesus has always existed. You see, Jesus carries the same eternal quality as God, which shouldn't be surprising because Jesus was God, right? John chapter 1. So I, you're also going to see that I'm going to use a lot of scriptures that I use a lot. I may use them in a little different way, but these scriptures are meaningful to me, obviously, because of the truths uh, that, that, that they declare. So in John chapter 1, 
He says, in the beginning was the Word. Now, the Word is capital W. And let me just go ahead and just point you out to verse 14. That it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father. The reason I want to point that out is because I want to just show you biblically that the Word is actually referring to Jesus. This name Word is actually referring to Jesus Himself. So he says, in the beginning was the Word. You could actually say, in the beginning was Jesus. You, it wouldn't be a... a a corruption of that scripture. So in the beginning was the word. Listen, the word was with God and the word was God. Verse two, he was in the beginning with God. Jesus is eternal, just like God is eternal. In fact, in Hebrews, I, and I hate when I, I think it's in chapter three, Cody, you might can help me out. Actually, Hebrews declares just plainly that everything was created by Jesus. That the Son is actually the creator. Well, we think of God as the creator. Well, how can that be? Because Jesus was God. Because Jesus was eternal. Um, 8.58, John chapter 8.58. John chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus, well, okay, so this is where, where they're talking to, about Abraham. And Jesus says, you know, uh, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And they say to him, well, you're not even 50 years old, but you've seen Abraham. And Jesus said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, he says, before Abraham was, I am. And it's all in capital letters. I am is all in capital letters in your Bible. It's I am. What he is equating there was because when Moses asked God at the burning bush, he said, well, what? What if the people, I don't even know your name. He said, I don't even know your name. And these people are going to ask me your name. What am I going to tell them? And God says, you tell them, I am. You tell them, I am. So when Jesus responded this way, and he said, I am, before Abraham was, I am. He was saying, I am eternal. He was also saying, I am the eternal creator, Jehovah God, who existed for all time. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 5. I'm actually doing more scriptures than... I mean, I'm doing all the scriptures that I have in my notes, but I was going to start cutting some out, but I haven't done that yet. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 5. This is the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's arrested. And in verse 5, as he, as he prays, he says, Father, glorify me with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So listen, again, an attribute that we always say about God is that God is eternal. Listen, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus was also eternal. He carried the same attribute as the eternal God, and he is eternal because, because he is God. Thanks, yeah, right, because he is God. So some other attributes. Do you want me to use the seminary word just to prove I have a, a seminary education? Or do you want me to just use the words that you can all understand? So one of the things that we say about God is that God is omnipresent. The thing that we say about God is that God can be anywhere and everywhere at any time and all the time. God's presence can be anywhere all of the time. Well, here's the deal. Jesus was also, Jesus was, I can't say was, Jesus is also omnipresent. Jesus can also be everywhere at, at, at every time. In cha Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, and I think this is the verse where Jesus says that where two or three are gathered to the, together in my name, there I will be in the midst. I will be in the midst of them. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I will be right there in the middle of them. He has the ability to have his presence Right where anyone and everyone are gathered in his name. If God is not omnipresent, then he can't be in this church and at the church down the street at the same time. Right? And if Jesus isn't omnipresent, then he can't be in your prayer group and be in somebody else's prayer group at the same time. Then he can't be listening to my prayer and hearing my prayer and answering my prayer and hearing your prayer and answering your prayer at the same time. Jesus says, where two or three people are gathered together in my name, he says, I'm going to be right there. I'm going to be right there smack dab in the middle of them. It doesn't matter when. It doesn't matter if, if it's after his death. It doesn't matter if it's before his death. It doesn't matter if there are other prayer groups going on, if there are other groups meeting in his name at that time. Jesus is able to be anywhere and everywhere all at the same time. He has the same attribute that we clearly understand uh, that God has as, as well. And 
chapter 28, verse 20 is the end of the Great Commission. And a verse that's probably familiar to all of you about going and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, <clears throat> teaching them all things I have commanded you. And then he says, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, I am with you. I will always be with you, even until the world ends, I will be with you. Well, if God, if Jesus can't be uh, everywhere at the same time and at any time, then that means that he can't be with you and be with me at the same time. It means he's got to pick. He's got to choose one or the other. He probably ain't choosing me. I'm just going to let you know that right up front. But if, unless he can be everywhere and anywhere all at the same time, unless he is omnipresent like God is, then he can't do that and he can't make that promise. But he does make the promise because he is omnipresent. God, Jesus can be anywhere and everywhere that God is all at the same time. Oh, gosh. He is also, he knows everything. Omniscient, seminary word. Uh, God knows everything. We, like to, we understand that God knows everything. Let me tell you something else. Jesus knows everything as well. Jesus has that same attribute of being able to know everything. In John chapter 17, uh, verses 22 through 27, I believe this is the passage. We're there at the temple, and everybody's given a tithe. And, you know, Jesus has this little conversation. I think it's with Peter. Um, give me the next verse. Give me the next verse. Oh, Brother Keith, you got to be able to follow yourself. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, 22 through, son of man, uh, verse 24 is really, I guess, where I needed it to start of chapter 17, Matthew. Um, it says they came uh, and they were supposed to pay their temple tax. And so uh, Jesus is having this conversation uh, with his disciple, with Peter, and um, the conversation is important. It's just not important to the point that I'm trying to make now. But it's like, do we, should we pay the temple tax? And, uh, you know, yes or no. And Jesus said, well, you know, I, I'm the son. I really don't have to pay the temple tax. But, but just so we don't make anybody mad, he says, we need to pay the tax. You understand, I'm giving you the Brother Keith version. And so here's what he tells Peter. He says, I want you to go fishing. He said, and you're going to catch a fish. The first fish you catch, you're going to pull him up. You're going to look in his mouth. And in his mouth is going to be a gold coin. And you're going to take that coin and you're going to bring it back and give it for the temple tax. Really? How do you know that? How do you know that? Because he knows everything. I thought only God knew everything. Well, yeah, Jesus is God. You see, he knows everything. In John chapter 4, it's the story of Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. And you remember what he had? He goes through this whole conversation with her about living water, drinking the water that I can give. And she's kind of at a place. She's ready. And so Jesus says, well, go get your husband. She says, well, I don't have a husband. You remember what Jesus said to her? He said, I know you don't have a husband. He said, the fact is you've had five husbands. And to top it off, the guy that you're with now, he isn't even your husband. Well, how does he know all that? You remember she ran back to town and she said, I met a guy who told me everything I ever did. You remember that? She ran, she, yeah, I met a guy who told me everything I ever did. It's because Jesus is an all-knowing. It's because Jesus is, uh, is, is omniscient. He is all-knowing. Uh, just like God is all-knowing. And the point I'm making here again is that Jesus has all the attributes of God, thereby proving that Jesus was God. He is also all-powerful. Matthew chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. In Matthew chapter 8, uh, verses 26 and 27. This is the passage where they're all in the boat. They're out in the sea. There's this great big huge storm that has come up and Jesus, they wake Jesus up. They're like, in, I don't know if this one's in the Matthew uh, account or one of the others. They wake Jesus up and they say, look, we're about to die here and you're sitting back here in the back of the boat and you're sound asleep. I mean, come on, we're about to die. And Jesus gets up and he just looks at him. He says, where's your faith? And he looks out at this great storm. He looks out to the sea and looks into this great, 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 great storm. And he says, peace be still. And immediately there was an extreme calm. He spoke to nature. 
he spoke to nature. Uh, and I think they even uh, uh, had some sort of response to that. Verse 27, it says, so the men marveled. They said, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Listen, only God can control nature, right? Well, yeah, that's right. Only God can control nature, which means Jesus can control nature as well. Uh, Luke chapter 7. No. Yes, no. Yes, no. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, 38. This is where he heals Peter's mother-in-law. Uh, she was sick. She had a fever. Came in. He healed her. Uh, Luke chapter 7. Let's see verses 14 through 16. Um, this is where he raised a little boy from the dead. Um, there's a woman. Um, it, that, that when they were going, they ran into a funeral procession. Uh, they came near, verse 12 says, they came near the gate of the city. A dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow, a large crowd from the cry was with her, from the city was with her. Uh, and when he saw her, he had compassion on her. And he said to her, do not weep. And then he came and he touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And so he who was dead sat up and began to speak and he presented him to his mother. He raised the dead. Jesus raised the dead. Who can do that? Only God can do that. Right. Only God can do that. And Jesus could do that because Jesus has the same power and the same attributes as God. And the reason is because Jesus was God. Let me, let me start really kind of cutting to the chase. In Jesus is eternal life. In you see, since Jesus was God, it is in him that we find life and that we find eternal life. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. John writes, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. John makes it very clear that life and eternal life is in Christ. And if you have Christ, you have eternal life. And if you do not have Christ, then you do not have eternal life. Who was Jesus? Who was he? So Jesus says, thank you, brother. So Jesus was walking along with his disciples one time uh, in Matthew chapter 16. And he says, who's everybody say that I am? And they say, well, some people say you're John the Baptist. Some people say you're Elijah. Some people say you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And he said, okay, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. When he went and met Mary and Martha at Lazarus' death and he was having this conversation with Martha because she was saying, you know, if you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died and even now I know that you can do whatever you want to do. And, and, and Jesus said, you know, your brother's going to rise again. And she said, well, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said, well, I am the resurrection and the life. And he says to her, he says, do you believe this? And she says, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ. I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Martha came to believe. Peter came to believe. Martha came to believe. In John chapter 1, verse 49, Nathaniel comes to believe. It's when uh, Jesus met Nathaniel. This is real early. This is in the calling uh, of the disciples. And he, and he met Nathaniel and he says, you know, um, here comes an Israelite in whom... Uh, there is no, there is no guile. And Nathaniel is kind of like, well, how do you know me? And, uh, and then Jesus tells him in verse 48, he says, well, I saw you when you were still sitting under the, the fig tree. Nathaniel's kind of creeped out by it, not creeped out by that. He understood that there was something very significant there. And he said to him, Rabbi, he says, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. He came to believe. Thomas, Thomas, you remember Thomas, right? Thomas, when they told him everything, they told him that Jesus had been resurrected and they told him all that stuff. And Thomas was like, mm, 
unless I can touch those wounds in his hands, unless I can touch that wound in his side, he's just like, I just, I just can't believe. So in John chapter 20, uh, starting in verse, it starts in verse 24, but I'm going to start it. I'm going to start in verse 26 after he said all those things. Then after eight days, uh, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them and Jesus came and the doors were shut and he stood in the middle of them and he said, peace to you. And then he spoke directly to Thomas. He says, reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it into my side. He said, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And look at what Thomas said. Thomas answered him and he said, my Lord and my God. Thomas came to believe. Jesus came to believe. Peter came to believe, Martha came to believe, Nathaniel came to believe. They all came to believe that Jesus truly was God. And here's the deal. When you believe this, you have to believe what Peter said. When Peter stood up in Acts chapter 4 and in verse 12, and he was preaching to all those people in Jerusalem and Judea uh, who were gathered there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, he said, there is no other name given among men by which you must be saved other than Jesus Christ. There is no other name given among men by which you must be saved. Uh, I believe it's Luke chapter 7 is the passage. It might be uh, Mark chapter 2. There's the passage uh, that I always use about the disciple, about the, the guys when Jesus was teaching. And the guys brought their crippled friend and uh, they brought him in and they let him down uh, through the roof of the house. Um, it, this is in, it's in Mark chapter 2. It's Mark chapter 2. Starts in the very beginning. They let him down through the roof of the house. He's crippled. Jesus looks down at him. And Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. That's what he says to him. He says, your sins are forgiven. And everybody started being like, well, who can do that? Only God can forgive sins. How is he forgiving sins? Only God can do that. And he looks at him. And I'm just going to give you the Brother Keith version of, of, what, of what he says there in that passage. He says, look, I just forgave this man his sins. Now, I know you can't tell. I know that you can't look at this man and tell that his sins are forgiven. I get it. He says, so just so that you'll know that I actually do have the authority and the power to forgive sins. Just so that you'll know. Watch this. He didn't say watch this. I like to think he did, but he didn't. He said, but just so you'll know that I actually am the one who forgives sins. He looks at the man. He says, stand up. Pick up your bed. And go home. And the guy stood up. And he picked up his bed. And he went home. You see Jesus. Was God. He has all the attributes of God. He did only the things that God can do. All of the disciples. All of the writers of the New Testament. Understood that he was God. Je and, don't, and listen. Just stop trying to explain a separation. Jesus Christ Jesus, the Christ, was Jehovah God in the flesh. He was God in the flesh. He was Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus was God. So the question is, do you believe that? And if you believe that, then what are you going to do about it? You see, it demands a response. See, here's where it starts getting spiritual and almost unexplainable. But Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And unless you're born again, you won't enter the kingdom of God. And he went on and talked to Nicodemus. He said, it's being born of the Spirit. You are being born of the Spirit. The Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ comes and lives inside of you. Well, how does that happen? You have to understand that you are a sinner. You and I, both of us, all of us, we are all sinners. We have all failed God. We have all gone away from God. And we need the forgiveness of God. And so we understand the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. That Jesus Christ... Jesus the Christ. I got to stop saying Jesus Christ. I got to start saying Jesus the Christ. That Jesus the Christ was God in the flesh, taking our sin upon him, 
taking it into the grave and coming back alive and thus leaving our sin in the grave and coming back showing that we too would have eternal life. And when you can acknowledge that you are a sinner and you can come to God and say to him, I am a sinner and I believe that the only way to have eternal life is through your son in whom there is eternal life and through the gospel that he died and was buried and rose again. And I will completely completely trust in that what happens then is that this God sends the spirit of his son to live inside of you you are born again whether you understand it or not whether you got it or not you were different and that's all you knew there was something different God sends his spirit to be inside of you and you become a child of God who do you say that Jesus is and now what are you going to do about it Stand up with me if you would. I appreciate your patience with me this morning and allowing me to come through that. But the message is so clear. The message is so important. The most important question you will ever answer for yourself in your life is the question that Jesus asked his disciples. Who do you say that I am? It's the most important question you'll answer for yourself. The thing is, the enemy is going to start distracting you into who you are. Forget it. It's not about who you are. It's about who is he. Who is he? It doesn't matter who you are. Who is he? And how are you going to respond? Uh, if you need to come forward this morning for any reason, if you'd like me to pray with you, I'd love to. If you want to come kneel at the altar and pray, you do that. If you need to, if you need to receive God's salvation, uh, come and talk to me about that. I'd be happy to pray with you about that. Whatever you need to do this morning, you do it right now while we sing.